Hi guys, good morning. This is Miss Carson. Um, I am going to be continuing to do our first chapter Fridays. Um, this week we are going to do um, Skyward by Brandon Sanderson. It is located in our fantasy sci-fi section. Um, from what I can tell, this is a the first book in a four-part series. Um, only the first and second books are out currently. The third and fourth will be published later. Um, and this book does not seem to have a summary, so I found one online that I'm going to read, and then I will start reading the first chapter. Um, the only thing the back of the cover does say is, Defiance is Survival. So, um, to be able to find a little blurb about the book itself, I looked up on uh, goodreads.com, and it says... Defeated, crushed, and driven almost to extinction, the remnants of the human race are trapped on a planet that is consistently attacked by mysterious alien firefighters. Spensa, a teenage girl living among them, longs to be a pilot. When she discovers the wreckage of an ancient ship, she realizes this dream might be possible. Assuming she can repair the ship, navigate flight school, and, perhaps most importantly, Persuade the strange machine to help her, because this ship, uniquely, has its own soul. So, I am going to start reading chapter one. Uh, and it looks like it's written in uh, different parts, so this is part one, chapter one. I stalked my inner enemy carefully through the cavern. I'd taken off my boots so they wouldn't squeak. I'd removed my socks so I wouldn't slip. The rock under my feet was comfortably cool as I took another si silent step forward. This deep, the only light came from the faint glow of the worms on the ceiling, feeding off the moisture seeping through cracks. You had to sit for minutes in the darkness for your eyes to adjust to that faint light. Another quiver in the shadows. There, near those dark lumps, that must be enemy fortifications. I froze in a crouch, listening to my enemies scratch the rock as he moved. I imagined a krill, a terrible alien with red eyes and dark armor. With a steady hand, agonizingly slow, I raised my rifle to my shoulder, held my breath, and fired. A squeal of pain was my reward. Yes! I patted my wrist and activating my father's light line. It sprang to life with a reddish-orange glow, blinding me for a moment. Then a rush came forward to cl claim my prize. One dead rat appeared straight through. In the light, shadows I'd imagined as enemy fortifications revealed themselves as rocks. My enemy was a plump rat, and my rifle was a makeshift spear gun. Nine and a half years had passed since that fateful day when I climbed to the surface with my father, but my imagination was as strong as ever. I'd helped relieve the monotony to pretend I was doing something more exciting than hunting rats. I held up the dead rodent by its tail. Thus you know the fury of my anger, fell beast. It turned out that strange little girls grow up to be strange young women, but I figured it was good practice, good to practice my taunts for when I really fought the crow. Grand Grand taught that a great warrior knew how to make a great boast to drive fear and uncertainty into the hearts of their enemies. I tucked my prize away in my sack. That was eight so far. Not a bad haul. Did I have time to find another? I glanced at my light line. The bracelet that housed it had a little clock next to the power indicator. 0900. Probably time to turn back. I couldn't miss too much of the school day. I slung my sack over my shoulder, picked up my spear gun, which I'd fashioned from salvaged parts I'd found in the caverns, and started to hike homeward. I followed my own hand-drawn maps, 
which I was consistently updating in my small notebook. A part of me was sad to have returned, to return and leave these silent caverns behind. This reminded me of my father. Besides, I liked how empty it all was. Nobody to mock me, <clears throat> nobody to stare, nobody to whisper insults until I was forced to defend my family honor by burying a fist in their stupid face. I stopped at a familiar intersection where the floor and ceiling gave way to a strange metal patterns. Circular designs marked with scientific writings covered both surfaces. I'd always thought that they must be ancient maps of the galaxy. On the far side of the room, an enormous ancient tube emerged from the rock one of many that moved water between the caverns, cleansing it and using it to cool machinery. A seam dripped water into a bucket I left, and it was half full, so I took a long drink, cool and refreshing, with a tinge of something metallic. We didn't know much about the people who had built this machinery, like the rebel belt. <clears throat> it had been here already when our small fleet crashed on the planet. They'd been humans, as the writings on the places like this room, ceiling, and floor were in human languages. But how distantly related they were to us was a mystery, even now. None of them were still around, and the melted patches and ancient wrecks on the surface indicated that they had suffered their own war. I poured the rest of the water into my canteen, which gave the large tube a fond pat before replacing the bucket and moving on. The machinery seemed to respond to me with a distant familiar thrumming. I followed that sound and eventually approached a glowing break in the stone on my left. I stepped up to the hole and looked out on Ingeus, my home cavern, the largest of the underground cities that made up the Defiant League. My perch was high providing me with a stunning view of a large cave filled with boxy apartments built like cubes splitting off one another. My father's dream had come true. In defeating the Krell that day, over nine years ago, those fledgling starfighter pilots had inspired a nation. Dozens of once nomadic clans had congregated colonizing Ingeus and the caverns around it. Each clan had its own name still, traced back to the ship or section of the ship they had worked on. My clan was the motor scap, from the old words of engine crew. Together, we called ourselves Defiance, a name taken from our own flagship. Of course, in gathering together, we had drawn the attention of the Krill, the aliens still determined to destroy humankind, so the war continued and we needed a constant stream of starfighters and pilots to protect our burgeoning nation. Towering over the buildings of Aegeus was the apparatus, ancient forges, refineries, and manufacturings that pumped molten rock from below that created the parts to build starfighters. The apparatus was both amazing and unique. Though machinery and other caverns provided heat, electricity, electricity or filtered water, only the apparatus was in Geus, of Ingeus was capable of the complex manufacturing. Heat poured through the cracks, making my forehead bead with sweat. Ingeus was a sweltering place. With all those refineries, factories, and algae vats, and though it was well lit, it sometimes felt, always felt gloomy inside. With that red-orange light from the refinery shining on everything, I left the crack and walked to an old maintenance locker I discovered in the wall here. Its hatch looked, at first glance, like any other section of the stone tunnel, and so relatively secure. I popped it open, revealing my few secret possessions some parts of my spear gun, some spare canteen, and my father's old pilot's pen. I rubbed that for good luck and then placed my light line, map book, and spear gun into the locker. 
I retrieved a crude stone-tipped spear, clicked the hatch close, and then slung my sack over my shoulder. Eight rats could be surprisingly awkward to carry, particularly when, even at 17, your body refused to grow beyond a hundred and beyond 151 centimeters. I hiked down to the normal entrance into the cavern. Two soldiers from the gr ground troops, which barely ever did any real fighting, guarded the way in. Though I knew them both by their first name, they still made me stand to the side as they pretended to call for authorization for me to enter. Really, they just liked to have me waiting. Every day, every scuttling day. Eventually, Akulo stepped over and began looking through my sack with a sp suspicious eye. What kind of contraband do you expect I'm bringing into the city? I asked him. Pebbles? Moss? Maybe some rocks that insulted your mother? He eyed my spear as if wondering how I'd managed to catch eight rats with a simple weapon. Well, let him wonder. Finally, he tossed the sack back to me. On your way, coward. Strength. I lifted my chin. Some day, I said, you will hear my name and tears of gratitude will spring to your eyes as you think of how, luck how lucky you are to once assisted the daughter of Chaser. I'd rather, I'd rather forget I ever knew you on your way. I held my head high and walked into Aegeus, then made my way towards the glorious rise of industry, the name of my neighborhood. I'd arrived at shift change and passed workers in jumpsuits of a variety of color, each marking their place in the great machine that kept the Defiant League and the war against the Krill functioning. Sanitation workers, maintenance techs, algae vat specialists, no pilots, of course. Off-duty pilots stayed in the deep caverns on reserve, while the on-duty ones lived in Alta, the very base my father died protecting. It was no longer secret, but had grown into a large installation of the surface, housing dozens of ships along with the pilot command structure and training facilities. That was where I would live starting tomorrow, once I passed the test and became a cadet. I walked under a large metal statue of the first citizens, a group of people holding symbolic weapons and reaching towards the sky in a defiant pose, ships raising behind them trailing streaks of metal. Though it depicted those who had fought at the Battle of Alta, my father wasn't among them. The next turn took me to our apartment, one of many metal cubes sprouting from a large central one. Ours was small, but big enough for three people, particularly since I spent days at a time out in caverns, hunting and exploring. My mother wasn't home, but I found Grand Grand on the roof, rolling algae wraps to sell at our cart. An official job was forbidden to my mother, because of what my father had supposedly done. So we had to get by doing something unconventional. Grand Grand looked up, hearing me. Her name was Becca Nightshade. I shared her last name. But even those who barely knew her called her Grand Grand. She had lost nearly all her sight a few years ago. Her eyes having gone a milky white she was hunched over and worked with stick-like arms, but she was still the strongest person I know. Ooh, she said, that sounds like Spencer. How did you get today? Eight, I dumped my spoils before her, and several are particularly juicy. Sit, sit, Grand Grand said, pushing aside the mat filled with wraps. Let's get cleaning these and cooking. If we hurry, we can have them ready for your mother to sell today, and I can get to tanning the hides. I probably should have gone to class. Grand Grand had forgotten again, but really, what was the point? 
these days, we were just getting lectures on various jobs one could do in the caverns. I had already chosen what I'd be, though the test to become a pilot was supposedly hard. Raj and I had been studying for 10 years. We'd pass for sure. So why did I near, need to hear about how great it was to be an algae vat worker or whatever? Besides, since I needed to spend time hunting, I missed a lot of classes. So I wasn't suited to do any jobs. I made sure to attend the classes that had to do with flying, ship layouts and repairs, mathematics, war history. Any other class I managed to make was a bonus. I settled down and helped Grand Grand skin and gut the rats. She was clean and efficient as she worked by touch. Whoa, she said. Who, she said, Bow, head bowed, eyes mostly closed closed. Did you want to hear about today? Beowulf. Ah, the king of geats it is. No Leif Erikson? He was your father's favorite. Did he kill a dragon? He discovered a new world with dragons. Grangrin chuckled. A feathered serpent by some legends, but I have no story of them fighting. Now Beowulf. He was a mighty man. He was your ancestor, you know. It wasn't until he was old that he slew the dragons. First, he made a name fighting monsters. I worked silently with my knife, skinning and gutting the rats, then slicing the meat and tossing it into a pot to be stewed. Most people in the city lived on algae paste, real meat from cattle or pigs raised in caverns, with special lighting and environmental equipment was far too rare for everyday eating, so they'd trade for rats. I loved the way Grand Grand told stories. Her voice grew soft when the monster hissed and bold when the hero boasted. She worked with nimble fingers as she spun the tale of the ancient Viking hero who came to the aid of Danes in their time of need, a warrior everyone loved one who bravely fought against a larger and mightier foe. And when the monster had slunk away to die, Grand Grand said, the hero, he held aloft Grendel's entire arm and shoulder as a grisly trophy. He avenged the blood of the fallen, proving himself with strength and valor. Clicking sounded from below in our apartment. My mother was back. I ignored that for now. He ripped the arm free, I said. With his hands? He was strong, Grand Grand said. He was a warrior, but he was of the olden folk who fought with hands and sword, she leaned forward. You know, fighting with nimbleness of both hands and wit. With the starship to pilot, you won't need to rip off any arms. Now, have you been doing your exercises? I rolled my eyes. I saw that, Grand Grand said. No, you didn't. Close your eyes. I closed my eyes and tipped my head back, face towards the ceiling of the cavern far below. Listen to the stars, Grand Grand said. I only hear, listen to the stars. Imagine yourself flying. I sighed. I love Grand Grand and her stories, but this part always bored me. Still, I tried to do... I tried doing as she had taught me, sitting there with my head tipped back. I tried to imagine that I was soaring upwards. I tried to let everything else fade around me and to picture stars shining brightly above. I used to do this exercise, Grand Grand said softly, with my mother on the Defiant in the engine rooms. We worked the flagship itself, a battle cruiser large enough, larger than this entire cavern. I'd sit and listen to the hum of engines and to something beyond that, the stars. I tried to imagine her as a little girl, and somehow that helped. With my eyes closed, I felt as if I were almost floating, reaching upwards. We, of the engine crew, Grandma said, were odd among the other ship crews. They thought we were strange, but we kept the ship moving. 
We made it travel the stars. Mother said it was because we could hear them. I thought, just for a moment, that I heard something out there. My imagination, perhaps? A distant, pure sound? Even after we crashed here, my people of the engines stayed together, Brave Red said. Clan Motorscout. If others say you're strange, it's because they remember this, and maybe fear us. This is your heritage. The heritage of warriors who traveled the sky, and will return to the sky. Listen. <clears throat> I let out a long, calming sigh as it, whatever I thought I heard, faded. I opened my eyes and was shocked for a second to find I was back on the rooftop, surrounded by the ruddy light of Aegeus. We maintained the engines, I said, and moved the ship? What does that have to do with being warriors? Wouldn't it have been better to fire the weapons? Only a fool thinks that weapons are the only, are more important than the strategy in motion, Grandma said. Tomorrow, let me tell you again of Sun Tzu, the greatest general of all time. He taught that position and preparation won wars, not spears and swords. A great man, Sun Tzu. He was your ancestor, you know. I prefer Genghis Khan, I said. A tyrant and a monster, Grand Grand said. Though, yes, there is much to learn from Great Khan's life. But have I ever told you about Queen Boudicca, defiant rebel against the Romans? She was your ancestor, Mother said, climbing the ladder outside the, build outside the building. She was a great Celt. Beowulf was Swedish. Genghis Khan, Mongolian, and Sun Tzu, Chinese. And they're all supposedly my daughter's ancestors. All of old earth is our heritage, Grand Grand said. You, Spensa, are one in a line of warriors stretching back millennia. A true line to the old earth and its finest blood. Mother rolled her eyes. She was everything I wasn't. Tall, beautiful, calm. She noted the rats, but then looked at me with arms folded. You might have the blood of warriors, but today, she's late for class. She's in class, Grand Grand said, the important one. I stood up, wiping my hands on a rag. I knew how Beowulf would face monsters and dragons, but how he would face his mother on a day he was supposed to be in school? I settled for a noncommittal shrug. Mother eyed me. He died, you know, she said. Beowulf died fighting that dragon. He fought to his last ounce of strength, Grand Grand said. He's defeated the beast, though it cost him his life. And he brought untold peace and prosperity to his people. All the greatest warriors fought for peace, Spensa. Remember that. At the very least, Mother said, they fought. They fight for irony. She glanced again at the rats. Thanks, but get going. Don't you have that pilot's test tomorrow? I'm ready for the test, I said. Today is just learning things I didn't need to know. Mother gave me an unyielding stare. Every great warrior knew when they were bested. So I gave Grand Grand a hug and whispered, Thank you, soul of a warrior, Grand Grand whispered back. Remember your exercises. Listen to the stars. I smiled, then went and quickly washed up before heading off to what would, I hope, be my last day of class. Um, so it definitely sounds like Spencer is uh, a little bit of a spitfire. Uh, has her own uh, way of thinking. Uh, I'm interested to see if she passes her pilot's test and ends up um, doing what she's always wanted to do. So, um, looks like a pretty good one. I will definitely like a book that's in a series, so I'll definitely continue that one. Uh, I hope you all are doing well. Uh, please reach out if you need anything. I know that Mr. Hearn and Mr. Williams and Mr. Gooding are all doing um, 
some Zoom calls for the different classes. So I will definitely be tuning into those. So I hope to see you there. Uh, otherwise, again, please reach out. I'll be happy to respond in any way that I can. Um, Y'all stay well and stay wet. Stay well read. Thanks, guys.